Well, once again, thank you guys for making this a priority this weekend to be here. Uh, this is a really important Sunday for us. And the reason why is if you've been coming for a while, you've known that we've gone through some pretty serious transition at this church. And um, about five years ago, I kind of had a crisis of faith, to, to put it mildly. And it wasn't like I was looking for it. It was I was seeking Christ is what I was doing. And there was just certain things that I recognized that just weren't lining up. And so I started studying the early church extensively um, and really what the faith handed down to us was. And along that way, um, there, this church like kind of went through a lot of different stuff with that. And you guys have, who have stuck around have been on that journey with me. And so today's a special day because throughout that time, I just kept praying. I knew that I needed some people in my life to help me in this journey. And I needed some people to help me, to guide me in this. And it, I was, it was a hard time finding that. So I just started praying. I just started praying that God would introduce me to certain people to help me navigate this so you could navigate this as well. And along that time, I met a man named Father Jarmus, who is an Eastern Orthodox priest and I met him randomly online, <laughs> not on Tinder, but uh, on Instagram. And I didn't even know who he was, he didn't know who I was, but he was so gracious in answering my questions and um, answering my questions about church history and theology. And he literally just walked me all the way back to Jerusalem uh, to show me how this all went down. And it was, it's been an incredible, hard journey, but I have never felt more peace with God throughout this journey. And this man has been a gracious mentor and friend. Um, and so I would like to introduce you to him today, my friend and mentor, Father Andrew Jarmus. Come on out. So the reason this is important is because at Zootown, we, are, we believe that the church has been too divided and um, we want to be a unifier with different perceptions, different perspectives, and we wanna bring the church together. And just a calling, you guys have heard me say this, one of the callings I feel for my life and for Zootown is to bridge the gap between evangelicalism and orthodoxy. And I believe that this is, the Eastern Orthodox is the faith handed down to us. And so he is going to share this wonderful expression of faith with you guys, um, and we're just so blessed to have you, Father Jarvis. Thank you so much, Pastor Scott. Pastor Scott tells that story in a, in a, very, uh, a very wonderful and warm way. My wife's version of the story is, my husband met a man online who said, come visit me in Montana. <laughs> I am so grateful to be here. We've, uh, Christy and I, my wife Christy and I have had such a, just a great visit seeing Montana, some wonderful people, their hospitality, the love of this, this community. Uh, I have to thank my bishop. He's in, an, in the Orthodox Church. A, a priest can't just leave his church and go talk somewhere. He needs the blessing of his bishop. So I'm so grateful that my bishop gave me the blessing to be with you this weekend. And obviously, and among the first and first and foremost, I thank God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for being able to be with you. I want to begin today by teaching you a traditional Eastern Orthodox greeting. So I say. Glory to Jesus Christ. So let us glorify Jesus Christ, and, or we will glorify Jesus Christ. And then you say, glory forever. We will glorify him forever. The dox in orthodox is the Greek word doxa, which means glory. So we identify ourselves as people who glorify God. So I say glory to Jesus Christ, and you say glory forever. We'll practice it once, and then we'll do it for real, okay? Okay. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to okay, now I don't want to tell you that the 9 a.m. service did it better than that. <laughs> this is the real one now, okay? Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to Wonderful. We are off to the most important start we could be off to, glorifying our Lord. I'd like to introduce you today to one of the great church fathers Basil of Caesarea, or as we know him in the Orthodox Church, St. Basil the Great. He lived in the fourth century, so in the 300s, and Caesarea is now a part of what is modern-day Turkey. He was a bishop, a teacher, a preacher. He was very influential in the, the monasticism in the, in the church. He, he saw the monasteries that were beside towns and in communities, and he said it wasn't enough 
For us as monks to simply seclude ourselves in these communities, we need to serve these communities. So maybe you've heard that the very first hospitals, halfway houses, and other philanthropic ministries came out of the church. They specifically came out of monasteries, specifically inspired by the vision of St. Basil the Great. So the next time you go to a hospital, a little quiet thank you to Basil the Great. He was also very uh, influential in, in our prayer life. If you open up an Orthodox prayer book, many prayers are attributed to Basil, including one of our communion celebrations. We call it the Divine Liturgy. So we have the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil the Great. And one of the elements in all ancient Christian liturgies, all ancient Christian communion celebrations, was that they told the story of our salvation. When Jesus says, do this in memory of me, they remember not just what Jesus did in his ministry, but they remember everything that happened before that that led to the need for his saving ministry and everything that will happen after that as well when he returns. So what I'd like to do for you today is using excerpts from the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil the Great, I'd like to share with you how the Orthodox Christian Church tells the story of our salvation. And before I begin, just two points, the first one being that some of this might be new to some of you here, but I want to assure you it's not new to Christianity. In fact, it, for the first thousand years of church history, it was Christianity. It's how everybody understood the story of our salvation. And for the second thousand years, it is still the story in the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church, how we understand our salvation. The other thing I'd like to ask you to keep in mind, though, is that these sacred texts from the ancient church, whether they're prayers or hymns or even the scriptures themselves, these sacred texts were not written as owner's manuals or as academic texts that clearly and systematically laid out the beliefs and laid out these things, that the ancient texts were actually prose. They were creative writing. And so it reads sometimes like poetry. And so you have to keep that in mind as you hear the words, because it's not always so straightforward. Everything gets lined up like that. It's, it's poetry. It's, cro it's prose. So St. Basil starts by saying, you form the human being by taking dust from the earth and honored him with your own image. In the Nicene Creed, we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. And human beings are unique in all creation because we are indigenous to both of those worlds. We are indigenous to the visible world, the physical world, and also to the invisible world, the spiritual world. We have bodies and souls as one entity. That's what makes up a human being. The book of Genesis tells us that we are made up in God's image and likeness. And how the Orthodox Church distinguishes between the image of God and the likeness of God is that the image of God are all of those God-like qualities that the Lord has put in us. So things like the ability to love, to be compassionate, to be creative, to forgive, Free will, that's an important one. All of these things that God has put into us as they exist as potentials, as possibilities. And that the likeness of God is growing into all of these potentials and possibilities in our lives. And that, that journey to become more like God is nothing that we can do on our own. It has to be by God's grace, but we would say that nevertheless, that is the meaning of life. That is what we were put here for. To grow more and more like God every day by his grace. So if you look at 2 Corinthians 3.18, we read, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of our Lord. Now Hebrews 1 calls Christ the, the brightness of God's glory. Christ is the glory. 
So we look at Christ as if we were looking in a mirror and we see what, by God's grace, we can become from glory to glory to glory to glory. Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 to 13, Paul writes, he himself, and this is why we have the ministries of the church, he writes, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and, the, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God gives us the church and her ministries for the purpose of helping us become more and more like him from glory to glory to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And when we talk about this journey in Orthodox texts, the go-to passage that we, we use is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. So his, which is God's, divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him by which have been given to us these exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, in short, through Christ, the grace of God gives us all that we need to live a holy life as partakers of the divine nature. Now, note, it does not just say observers of the divine nature to gaze upon the glory of God, but partakers of it to take part in that glory. St. Basil continues, you placed him in the paradise of delight. You promised him immortality of life and enjoyment of eternal good things in the observance of your commandments. Paradise of delight. In Hebrew, the word delight is Eden. So you placed him in this paradise called Eden. And Eden was a garden temple. It was a place of God's presence. And in the Orthodox Church, the teaching is that Eden was a limited place, a small limited place on the earth. And our job, one of our goals in life, when God says to us, be fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth, when he says subdue the earth, that does not mean exploit the earth. But our job was to take the boundaries of Eden and expand them until Eden was the entire planet, the entire world a garden paradise in, the, in God's presence. And we had one rule, of course, in all of that, just one. Genesis 2, 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And you have to pay attention to something in there. God did not say to Adam and Eve, when you eat that fruit, I will kill you. He said, when you eat that fruit, you will die. He was outlining the consequence. It wasn't the punishment for the sin. It was the consequence of the sin. So we were warned, but of course, we didn't listen. So St. Basil continues, when he disobeyed you, the true God who had created him and was led astray by the guile of the serpent and was put to death by his own transgressions, you, God, in your righteous judgment, sent him forth from paradise into this world and returned him to the earth from which he was taken. So in the final analysis, our lives have one of two basic trajectories. We can either become more like God, or we can become more like the dust. That's pretty much it. With God, there is life. From glory to glory, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Turn away from God, and life starts coming apart at the seams. Now, Basil talks here about the guile of the serpent, the temptation of the serpent. Now, when you look at that temptation, you see it's not a temptation to full-on heinous iniquity. The temptation was just a twisting of the truth. The serpent said to, to Eve, if you eat the fruit, you'll become like God, and God doesn't want that. That last bit there, that was the lie. Because God created us to become like him. But God knew, and the serpent knew, 
that we couldn't do that without God. And so in the Orthodox Church, the, the saints teach us that the, the essence of the original sin was that we tried to become God without God. And you just can't do that. Okay, so we eat the fruit. What happened next? Well, okay, we got kicked out of Eden, right? Not quite. Because Adam and Eve look at each other, they, they feel vulnerable, they realize they're naked, they hide themselves from each other, they hide from God. God finds them and God asks them a question. He says, what happened? Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent, they kind of blame God because you made all this and set all this up. So in the Orthodox Church, we, the, the teaching is that when God asks Adam and Eve what happened, he's giving them an opportunity to take responsibility for what they did and to ask for forgiveness. So it wasn't just eat the fruit, get kicked out. Eat the fruit, God gives them yet another opportunity to make it right. They don't do it, they don't take responsibility, and then God says you have to leave. But even after we miss that opportunity, even after God expels us from paradise, he still was not done with us. And so St. Basil continues, truly, he says, you did not turn away from your creature whom you had made, O good one, nor did you forget the work of your hands, but through the tender compassions of your mercy, you watched over him in various ways. So if you go on to Bible Gateway, Blue Letter Bible, one of the online Bible uh, sites, and if you do a search for the phrase, his mercy endures forever, in the Old Testament, that phrase, his mercy endures forever, appears 44 times. 33 of those times are in the Psalms. 26 of them are in one Psalm. That's Psalm 136. It's the refrain of every single verse of Psalm 136. Over and over again, we are reminded, his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. Why do you think we're reminded of that so many times? Because we need to be reminded of that. Because <laughs> sometimes it's so hard for us to accept that. Even when we had completely messed up in the garden, he still wasn't done with us. His mercy endured forever. So when you think about the uh, parable of the prodigal son, that parable could easily also be called the parable of the compassionate father. Because in short, the son, the younger son, takes his inheritance, goes wasted on wild living, decides eventually when he comes back to his senses to go home to his father. And it says, while he was still a long way off, the father saw him coming and ran out to him and embraced him, and took him home. The father saw him coming while he was a long way off because the father was looking for him, was waiting for him to come back. But that's not the end of it, because then he takes him home, has this big party, his older brother is still in the fields, he comes back, he sees this party going on, asks the servant, hey, what's going on here? Servant explains, your younger brother came home, and the older brother is offended. Here I am, so dutiful, and you do nothing for me, this guy comes home, you throw him a party, and he refuses to go into the party. And again, the parable says, the father sees that his older son is not at the celebration, and he goes out to the older son and says, son, what is wrong? See, God's mercy endures forever. He is always watching for us and waiting for our return. God is never done with us. We cannot out the love and mercy of God. Don't even try. It's just, just trust me. <laughs> so now St. Basil goes on to talk about what God did for us in his mercy. He says, you perform mighty works through your saints who in every generation have been well-pleasing to you. You spoke to us by the mouth of your servants, the prophets, foretelling to us the salvation that was to come. You gave the law as a help and you appointed angels as guardians. So, we have the law of Moses, and we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how the Orthodox Church understands how these two things relate to each other is that the law of Moses is to the gospel of Christ what an EMT is to a doctor. So, God forbid you're in an accident, you have a medical emergency at home, you call the EMTs. The job of the EMT is to keep you stable while 
they get you to the hospital where the physician can then take you and work on you with the various remedies and things that they have at the hospital for your healing. So how we understand the Old Testament and the New Testament, that the role of the Old Testament, the law of Moses, was to keep us, we're the patient, humanity, broken and wounded, to keep us stable until the physician could come, and that's Christ, to then give us the remedy, the healing remedy. And that's an important thing too, because in the Orthodox Church, we believe that, that Christ is the divine physician. And the church is a spiritual hospital. St. John Chrysostom said, do not be afraid to draw near to the church, for she is not a court for criminals. She is a hospital for the infirm. Salvation is healing. St. Basil continues, it's time for the physician to come, and, and in this next little bit, you'll probably hear some familiar verses, because what he does next is weaves together some scripture, something from Galatians 4, Hebrews 1, Philippians 2, and 2 Corinthians 3. So he says, when the fullness of time had come, you spoke to us through your son himself, through whom you also created the ages, who being the radiance of your glory and the image of your being, upholding all things by the word of his power, did not think being equal to you, the God and Father, a thing to be held on to. But being God before all ages, he appeared on earth and lived among us. And becoming incarnate of a holy virgin, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Becoming conformed to the body of our lowliness, that he might conform us to the image of his glory. So the Cliff's Notes version of that. The Son of God himself, the creator of the entire universe, the revealer of God the Father to us, did not think that it was beneath his dignity to become one of us so that we could become one with him. And note at the end of that passage what it says that he, he makes us conformed to the image of his glory. See, it's more image talk and it's more glory talk. St. Basil continues weaving together some more scripture, Romans 5, Galatians 4, and 1 Corinthians 15. He says, For as by man sin entered into the world, and by sin death, so it pleased your only begotten Son, who was in the bosom of you, the God and Father, born of a woman, the Holy Mother of God and ever Virgin Mary, born under the law to condemn sin in his flesh, so that those who are dead in Adam might be made alive in your Christ himself. I don't have a lot of time to talk to you about Mary today. I'd love to, but I just don't have the time. But let's focus in on one thing. And this is the title that we give Mary in the Orthodox Church and also in the Catholic Church as well, and it's Mother of God. Where does that come from? So, in Luke chapter 1, we read about the Archangel Gabriel coming to Mary to tell her that she has been called to be the mother of the Messiah. And there's an important thing we need to understand there the angel did not come to tell Mary she was pregnant. He came to tell her that she had a, a calling to become the mother of the Messiah. And it was not until she says, and this is verse 38, let it be done to me according to your word, and, and not until she assented to that calling that Christ was incarnate in her womb. After that, it says Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is also pregnant. She's pregnant with John the Baptist. And this is Elizabeth's reaction when she sees and hears Mary. Luke 1, verses 41 to 43, and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth calls Mary the mother of my Lord. Okay, so who is Elizabeth's Lord? It's not Caesar. It's not Herod. It's not the high priest. Elizabeth's Lord is God. So in that verse, in that passage, Elizabeth is calling Mary the mother of God. Now that title is important for us because it is, a, it, it is about Christ. It's about the incarnation. It's about the idea that since we believe that life begins at conception, 
that it is the incarnate Son of God in Mary's womb. That God enters into the world at conception. We celebrate it on December 25th, the fulfillment of the incarnation, if you will. But it begins that, at that moment that Mary says, let it be to me according to your word. And so we call her mother of God because from the moment of conception, the incarnate Son of God is, carrying, is in her womb. Basil says that Christ comes so that those who are dead in Adam may be made alive in Christ. And we have this in the scriptures, this idea of the first Adam and Christ as the second Adam. So 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49, we read, and, and so it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Whoever... However, the spiritual is not first but the natural and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of earth and made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have been born, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Through the first Adam, sin and death enter the world. Through the second Adam, Christ, we are delivered from sin and death. Everything comes full circle. And notice that in, this, in this, these verses, Paul calls being saved, bearing the image of Christ, bearing the image of the heavenly man. We become like Christ, the second Adam. So through the first Adam, God's image in us is broken, and through the second Adam, Christ, God's image in us is restored. That's the idea. Next, St. Basil talks about what Christ did for us in his earthly ministry for our salvation. He says, living in this world, giving us the commandments of salvation, turning us from the deceit of idols, he brought us to the knowledge of you, the true God and Father, obtaining us for himself as a treasured people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That last little bit is from 1 Peter chapter 2. So Christ delivers us from the deceit of idols. But we have to understand that this is not just about golden calves. It's about much more than that. An idol is anything of this world that we grasp onto white-knuckled for peace and guidance and some kind of existential stability. And that could be fame. It could be money. It could be the feeling that I'm always right. It could be the need to be in control all the time. It could be resentment, a desire for retribution. It could be my job. It could even be my kids. And we can always tell what God we really worship because it's whatever we are willing to make sacrifices for at the expense of other things in our lives. The thing that we will always say yes to without any regard for all the things we also say no to at the same time, that's our God. And the only one, the only one who deserves that kind of sacrifice in our life is the true and living God himself. That's it. And the amazing thing is that when we make those kinds of sacrifices in our life for the true and living God, he receives those things. He blesses them and he gives them back to us even better than they were when we gave them to him. In Matthew 16, 25, Jesus says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, anything that we are willing to give up for Christ, we don't lose. You make an offering to an idol, you got nothing. You make an offering to the living God, you get more than you offered up in the first place. And what Christ does for us, St. Basil says, is brings us, he brings us to a knowledge of God the Father. And in John 17, 3, Jesus defines eternal life. What does it mean to have eternal life? John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And in the scriptures, to know God is not to hold facts about God in our heads, it is to have the presence of God in our hearts. So Galatians 2, St. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
Then St. Basil gets to the cross. And just pay attention to how he introduces the cross. We'll get, get to it in a second. He says, And cleansing us in water and sanctifying us with the Holy Spirit, he gave himself as a ransom to death in which we were held captive, sold under sin. And descending through the cross into Hades, that he might fill all things with himself, he loosed the pangs of death. And rising on the third day, making for all flesh a path to the resurrection from the dead, since it was not possible for the source of life to be held by corruption, he became the first fruits of the fallen asleep, the firstborn of the dead, so that he is first all things in all. Our understanding of Christ as our Savior is this in the Orthodox Church, that Christ, the divine physician, heals the wounds of our broken humanity by entering into every aspect of human life. Hebrews chapter 4 says that he is like us in every way except sin. Because you see, wherever we find the physician, wherever we find Christ the healer, we find his healing grace. And taking part in every aspect of human life meant he had to take part in death. But when Christ gives up his soul and it descends into Hades like every soul before him, Hades gets more than it bargained for. St. John Chrysostom says that Hades took a man and met God face to face. And Hades itself is overcome by the presence of God, broken by the presence of God. And Hades no longer can hold us captive, and we are free from death itself. But why death by crucifixion? Why the cross? Well, there are three reasons why the cross. First of all, Jesus' death had to be public. I mean, if he'd have gone off into the desert by himself on a Friday and died and rose on the Sunday and came back to his apostles and said, guess what? Who would have believed him? Because when you read the Gospels, you realize that this part of his, of his teaching, that the Messiah had to die, the apostles were having real trouble with. Because in Judaism, there are no dead messiahs. So it had to be public. Second, Jesus' death had to be clearly voluntary, and this is very important. Jesus was not a hapless victim. He was not collateral damage in the socio-political events of his day. And that's why before the Passion, Christ keeps telling his apostles what's going to happen. And over and over again in the Gospels, it makes the point that everything Jesus encounters in the Passion all the way up to the crucifixion, he does so voluntarily. Even to the end, it doesn't say that Jesus died. It says Jesus gave up his spirit. He did it. So his death had to be public. It had to be clearly voluntary. And the third thing, his death had to demonstrate how far Christ went to fill every human experience with his life-giving grace and his life-giving presence. He went all the way to the shadows and the fringes of our experiences. In Hebrews 13, 12, it says, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Now that means historically outside the gate of Jerusalem. But to suffer outside the Jerusalem means he was treated like a stranger. He was abandoned. He was betrayed. He was out on the fringes. He went out to the fringes of human existence. And out on the fringes, we know what's there. Pain and shame. Crucifixion had plenty of pain. We know that. But it was also viewed as a very shameful way to die. If somebody in your family was crucified, it brought shame to your entire family. And when you look at the Gospels, they don't emphasize the pain that Jesus endured. They emphasize the shame that he endured. But he makes fun of him. His own closest people abandon him. All these things. You see, shame is one of our greatest adversaries in our spiritual healing. Shame gets in the way. It gets in the way of us taking responsibility for our sins, for our errors. It gets in the way of us seeking forgiveness. It gets in the way of us offering forgiveness. We have to break through shame. 
And so we know that even in the depth of our shame, we have nothing to fear because Christ's healing presence is there. So the crucifixion, as we understand it in the Orthodox Church, is a rescue mission. Christ in his selfless love and mercy willingly entered into every aspect of human life, the good, the bad, the tragic, to fill them with his healing presence. And when we call this a ransom, when we say that he paid the price, this is simply shorthand for saying that he did everything necessary for our salvation. Now, St. Basil began that little section by saying this, he cleansed us with water and sanctified us with the Holy Spirit. John 3, chapter 5, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is the second birth, to be born again. Literally, in Greek, it says to be born from above. And so the, the birth of water and spirit opens God's saving grace to us. So that what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago on the other side of the world becomes ours through water and spirit and all the ministries that Christ offers us through his people, the church. So this becomes ours through that. Then we get to the core of everything. We get to the resurrection, rising from the dead, he says. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 17 to 20, I think Paul writes, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The fear of death drives us into all kinds of toxic behavior, impulses, appetites that are no good for us, like a drowning person just grabbing onto anything that they can to keep their heads above water. But when death is overthrown, the engine that drives that fear has been neutralized. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? Then finally, St. Basil says, ascending into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of your majesty on high, and he will come again to render to each according to his works. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, when he had himself, by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And Hebrews 8 calls Christ our high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So Christ is the one seated at the right hand of the majesty. In the scriptures, seating is import, seating, sitting is important because sitting is a sign of authority. You look at a, a scripture, anything in the gospels, whoever's sitting down, that's the one who's in charge. So the fact that Christ ascends and sits again means that he has accomplished everything necessary for our salvation and he goes back to heaven to return to his place of authority at the right hand of the Father. With us, he took the form of a servant, but now he sits on high as what Revelation calls the ruler of all. But we have to note that when he ascends back to heaven, he doesn't leave his human body behind. He ascends in his humanity as well as his divinity. And what this means is he takes our humanity, he takes us to a place we didn't even have before. So it's not just that he saves us, but he actually kind of improves our lot. In Galatians 3.26, we are, it says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, if you are a son, it means you are a full inheritor of the Father's blessings, the Father's treasures. So regardless of our gender, we are all sons in that respect, full inheritors of the Father's blessings. So by ascending up to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, you see, he gives us a place at that, there too. And we too are full inheritors of the Father's blessings. In Acts chapter 1, this is the end of the ascension reading, about the, the passage about the ascension. This is verses 9 to 11. It says, Now when he had spoken these things, Jesus had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up to heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. 
As you saw him leave, he'll return again. And Matthew 16, 27 says, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he, will, he will reward each according to his works. So, the Orthodox Christian teaching on the second coming and the last judgment. Christ will return in glory, and that glory will fill, will infuse all places, all things, and all people. And the judgment is what that glory reveals in us. It's not a courtroom where Jesus says, you go that way and you go this way. It's a revealing of really what's going on inside of us in the light of his glory. The lives we've lived, the trajectory we've chosen. And in the Orthodox Church, and this is, this is I, I would say, the most unique teaching of, the, of Orthodox Christianity, in the Orthodox Church we believe that heaven and hell are the same place. Got you paying attention now, don't I? <laughs> heaven and hell are the same place. It's not even a place, actually. It's, it's, a, it's a state of being, a condition of being. It is a, a reaction to the glory of God. Everybody's filled with God's glory. Those who are ready for that, with humble hearts and trust in God's mercy, will experience that glory as joy and fulfillment. That's heaven. Those who have willfully rejected God, refusing to turn away from their sin, will also experience the glory, but they'll experience it as regret and torment of the thing that they lost because of their own choices. And that, my friends, is hell. Everybody gets to experience the glory of Christ but not everybody gets to experience it in the same way. So the Bible is the story of how God prepares us to be with him in his glory forever. But again, not just to gaze upon that glory, to be partakers of that glory, partakers of the divine nature. And that glory, what that really is, is the brilliance of Christ's selfless love. Agape, we call it, right? On an Orthodox crucifix, like the one I'm wearing now, above Jesus' head, it does not say the King of the Jews. It says the King of glory. In John 17, 1, Jesus begins his great high priestly prayer to the Father before he goes to his crucifixion with these words, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. The glory of Jesus Christ is his death on the cross, the extent to which he loved us. And you know, the Bible is full of paradoxes, and this is probably the greatest paradox of all, that the thing that the world saw as this great sign of shame, crucifixion, and the cross, becomes our great sign of victory and forgiveness. Christ inverts everything like that. So the glory is the brilliance of Christ's selfless love. So, in this life, the more that we immerse ourselves in selfless love, first of all for God and then for our neighbor, the closer we get to Christ. But not just the closer we get in proximity, the closer we get in resemblance to Christ as well. And entering into that journey, his grace fills our lives, it heals our wounds, and it leads us on that continuing journey from glory to glory to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Well, I think I've said enough. Let's end as we began. See if you remember. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory Amen. God bless you all. And now in the Orthodox Church, all of our songs are a cappella, so I don't get to say this at all. Band, come on up. <laughs>